Welcome everyone to this uh, webinar entitled Laying the Foundations for Treaty, in which we mark the launch of the new agreements, treaties and negotiated settlements website. And we will reflect also on the significance of data, research and knowledge uh, and their integral contribution to Indigenous nation building and treaty making. It's a special honour to achieve this achievement with our colleagues and indeed our dear friend, uh, Professor Marcia Langton, whose hard work and leadership over many years has brought us to this happy point. I'm Professor Pip Nicholson, Dean of the Melbourne Law School at the University of Melbourne, and I'll facilitate our conversations this evening. But in the first instance, a particularly warm welcome to you all. It's my very, very great pleasure this NIDOC week, and indeed every week, to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I work, the people of the Kulin Nation. And I wish to pay my respects to their elders past and present, and to their emerging leaders also, uh, as well as to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us this evening. Welcome. Shortly, we will hear recorded introductory marks from Duncan Maskell, Vice-Chancellor at the University of Melbourne, and the Honourable Ken Wyatt, Minister for Indigenous Australians. This will be followed by a discussion with a very wonderful panel of distinguished leaders and experts. But first, it is a particular pleasure to invite Wurundjeri Elder Uncle Dave Wandon to welcome us to country. Uncle Dave is the Wurundjeri Corporation's Manager of Cultural Practices for Fire and Water and is a respected expert in cultural burning. I would like to thank you very much, Uncle Dave, for your hard work on our behalf in taking care of country. Thank you very much for that warm introduction, Pip. Uh, yes, my name is Dave Wandon, and I am an elder of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Tribal Land Council. And I'm here to give you a welcome to country. Most welcomes you will hear are done in language. Language is not my specialty. As you heard, my specialty is in land management, fire, water, vegetation, animals, plants, reptiles, all of those things that make our country great. Other people learn language. Not all elders do know everything. We are expected to know everything, but it's not always the way. I start off my welcome with three words, which hopefully makes it for everybody who's never listened to language before, easier to understand. And that is Wamijika, Wurundjeri Biak. Welcome to Wurundjeri country. I pay my respects to my elders and ancestors, both past and present for the knowledge that they have been able to pass down to me that I can pass on to my children and their children and continue the practice of culture of the Aboriginal people of Australia. I pay my respects to all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that are here with us today, to their ancestors and their elders, both past and present, but also emerging. For the same reason that we can exchange knowledge amongst each other as we work towards treaty, as we've worked towards Traditional Land and Settlement Act, as we've worked towards native title, we have started to reunite. We have started to share knowledge. And we understand that not every Aboriginal community has all the knowledge of the land that they were given responsibility for. But by sharing knowledge, exchanging ideas, by moving backwards and forwards through country, through observing country, reading country, we have been able to build up a picture and re-establish our cultural practices, our spiritual practices, and indeed the spirit of our community. One thing that I have found in working with mobs mainly up and down the east coast of Australia, but some from central Australia as well, The one thing that we have, we have, have a commonality, editor in chief. and that is we pay our respects to our creator spirit. 
we have to call it a creator if spirit. I don't know why we call it a creator spirit because we are recognised as a culture, Best but regards. not a religion. Full and yet, Aaron. the meanings behind what we do as Aboriginal people is very closely related to what the modern world calls religion. It is no different. We use the same methods, the same rituals to actually go on to do the work that we have been asked to do for my case in, in Wurundjeri country is represented by Bunjil the Wedge-Tailed Eagle who gave us the first law. Now, of course, in this day and age, we live under many laws that are set down by governments. But in Aboriginal communities, we had one law from our father created in Wurundjeri country anyway. And that is we must care for the spirit of our mother, just as our mother cared for us as we were children, who nurtured us, who healed us when we were sick, who provided clothing, taught us how to collect food, gather our resources from the day prior to colonisation, uh, that as she gets older, we return the favour to our physical mother. We must also think of the land that we were given responsibility by our creator spirit. That we need to think of the land the same way as we do our mother. Yes, we all love our fathers too, but mother is so important in the in the development of us as children. And the spirit of our mother is increasingly important in the development of the human race. There is some interruptions going in the background, so it is throwing me off a bit, sorry about that. Um, so the thing is that we need to do about treaty is remember that it is remembering what caring for our, what it feels like to care for our physical mother and how we translate that into how we actually care for our spiritual mother, which of course is the country that we work, live and play on and rely on for our food, clothing and our shelter. And if we can stop thinking the economic terms and think about the ecological terms and walk country, learn to read country, understand when country is sick, we can actually start to heal country. And as a land manager, that's what I do. I heal country by applying medicine. It's not by applying chemicals that come from overseas or out of a laboratory. It's about going, it's about understanding how to read country and what we can do to heal country. Because I do know that in my work of training young people to work in land management, that as we heal country, we are healing the spirit of our mother. And at the same time, we're here healing the spirit of our children. Those children have been left behind, have been um, considered not to be valuable to today's society. It's been put in the too hard basket by allowing Aboriginal people to teach Aboriginal people the ancient laws our young people actually learn and heal themselves. So my message to you throughout all, not only the launch of this website, but through all of the treaty process is remember, it is not for us. It is, of course, it is about past injustices and recompens recompensating, uh, arbitration, all those kind of things. But remember what the goals are. The Bunjil set down the law for us to care for country for us while we are living on it at the time, but to make sure we leave enough behind for our children and our children's children. Now, as we've been here for thousands, tens of thousands of years, what we leave behind must be something that has value for many, many more thousands of years, not a three year government cycle or a 10 year government cycle or a 20 year government cycle. We must think of the land as if for at least a thousand years. The way we are going, we're not going to have it. We are going to be making our children suffer. So my message to you is whatever you do every day, when you walk out, realize that it is not any one person's land. We keep hearing traditional owners. We are not traditional owners. We are traditional custodians. We are given the responsibility while we are alive to look after this earth, to pass it on, not to take what we can get out of it, 
that benefits me more than somebody else or you more than somebody else. It is to make sure that whatever we take out, we return for the next generations that are to come. And hopefully there will be thousands and thousands of more generations. So let's walk country together and heal country together because as we heal country together, we heal ourselves as people. Well, Minjika, Wurundjeri, Biak, welcome to Wurundjeri country and thank you. Thank you, Uncle Dave, for your generous welcome to country today. I begin by acknowledging you and all the Wurundjeri elders, and I express my gratitude to you and the elders for your continuing spirit of generosity towards the university. I would also like to pay my respects to all the traditional custodians of the lands on which the University of Melbourne stands, and from all parts of the country from which today's participants come. I do so especially acknowledging Indigenous elders, past, present and emerging. It is a great pleasure to be part of the launch today of an important new resource for the agreements, treaties and negotiated settlements project. The ATNS website is a unique and highly significant initiative born out of a great partnership between the National Native Title Council and the University of Melbourne's Indigenous Studies Unit. Here, I extend a particular welcome to National Native Title Council members, particularly their CEO, Jamie Lowe, and board members. As Vice-Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, I want to say that I'm incredibly impressed by the efforts of my colleagues who are engaging in this work and in a range of partnerships with Indigenous communities. This is one of the most important focus areas for our work as a university, and I want you to know that I am 100% in support of these efforts at every level. Indeed, I believe that universities, and especially our university, needs to be at the forefront nationally in contributing to the growth of Indigenous knowledge and research, and its wider dissemination in the community. This is a key strategic focus at Melbourne, so I am especially grateful to my colleagues for all the work that you put into this and other projects, including Marcia Langton, Amanda Porter and Pip Nicholson, who have facilitated this event. Finally, I want to say that we are very grateful for the support of the Federal Minister for Indigenous Australians, Ken Wyatt. The Minister's participation is acknowledgement of the huge value of the work that has gone into creating this important new knowledge resource, a resource that I am confident will go a long way to building understanding of agreements, treaties and negotiated settlements with Indigenous people in Australia and around the world. Congratulations to everyone involved in creating the ATNS website. And it's my pleasure now to hand over to the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Ken Wyatt. Hello to all of you participating in this webinar as part of the National Treaties Summit series. I'd like to start by acknowledging the lands on which we are all meeting on today and pay my respects to our elders, past, present and young leaders coming through. Thank you to the organisers, Australians for Native Title and Reconciliation, the National Native Title Council and the University of Melbourne for inviting me to speak on this important occasion. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. We gather to celebrate the launch of the new website for agreements, treaties and negotiated settlements project. I'm proud that the Australian Government has played a facilitative role in this project and I celebrate the vast store of agreements to which the project provides access. The project demonstrates the great diversity in legal frameworks, political environments, and the social, economic, and cultural circumstances of parties which form the backdrop to agreements. In Australia, we have over 1,300 registered Indigenous land use agreements, more affectionately known as ILUAs covering more than 34% of Australia. They deal with su subject matters as varied as access to single pastoral leases and comprehensive whole of country native title settlement settlements. Each of these agreements has its own story. Reaching consensus is not easy. It is often hard won. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people must be equal partners at the negotiating table freely consenting to agreements. We should take heart that agreement making is a regular occurrence and that the resulting agreement can enrich the individuals and communities involved and ultimately the nation. It is invaluable that this website includes examples of agreements and treaties from across the world. These offer examples for agreement making from which we can learn. 
The agreements, treaties and negotiated settlement projects also demonstrate that Australia is on its own unique path towards recognition of First Peoples and shared decision making, a path that the Morrison government supports. We have a unique national statutory framework for a resolution of native title at the local level. We are committed to giving Indigenous people a real say on issues that affect them nationally and driving local solutions to improve outcomes at the local level. Our government is committed to working in partnership at the local level to realise improved outcomes for Indigenous Australians. We are already working with the empowered community leaders communities and stakeholders across nine regions to improve engagement and delivery in partnership with local community leaders. We are co-designing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people the details of a national Indigenous voice. We're also working together to develop proposals looking at how local communities can come together so that their voices are heard, including greater input into local and regional decision making in partnership with governments. Together, this forms the proposals for an Indigenous voice. Two of the panellists you'll hear from, Professor Mar Dr Marcia Langton, AO, and Mr Jamie Lowe, have been integral members of this work so far, and I thank them both for their leadership and support in this process to date. The first stage of this co-design process is now complete. Co-design groups submitted an interim report to me on the 23rd of October 2020, detailing proposals for an Indigenous voice. All Australians will be invited to provide feedback on the proposals through the next stage of the process, and I encourage you all to engage in these discussions so that the feedback reflects the diversity of views across this nation. Access to and utilising the diverse experience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in decision-making is a great strength and one key in making us a, as a stronger as a nation. So I congratulate the project partners for making this wealth of information available to all through the agreements, treaties and negotiated settlements project. This piece of work is at the front end of the way in which we must inform ourselves of models that exist across this nation across the globes and since the days of Lowage's Section 13 ATSEC committee, I have always been intrigued about the way in which treaties have been negotiated, on what basis and what were the outcomes that have been achieved. What we have to do is make sure that when we enter into agreements, that we have at our disposal all of the relevant information and models that we can utilise to reach an agreement for our part of the country that belongs to us as individuals and as communities. And I know that the amount of work that has gone into this initiative is staggering when you consider the hours of doing research, bringing together uh, the information and putting it into a form that is easily accessible. So you have my sincere gratitude for what you've done and I wish you well in your panel discussion, and I look forward to having further discussions uh, with those who've been involved, and I myself would explore the site to see what elements uh, are of interest, but what frameworks exist around the globe. Congratulations to all involved, and have a great time. I'd just like to add to the chorus of thanks for Uncle Dave's Welcome to Country. Thank you, Uncle Dave. It's now time to begin our conversation with the panellists. But before I introduce them, I would like to accord my own pride that the agreements, treaties and negotiated settlements resource had a beginning that included some of my colleagues from the Melbourne Law School, both faculty members and students. And some of those fine folk are here with us tonight. From the Law School, I would particularly like to acknowledge the work of Professorial Fellow Maureen Tian, who played a very important role right from the start. I'd also like to acknowledge the work of Professor Lee Godden and Miranda Stewart, as well as the law students and graduate researchers, Emily Cheeseman, Angus Frith, Adette Mazel, 
and Lily O'Neill. I want to acknowledge the many contributions of my colleagues and to thank them for it. We are obviously all delighted to see this interdisciplinary partnership that has yielded such a useful resource and one that can be directly applied by Indigenous communities in both nation building and their advocacy. Just a little housekeeping note, tonight we are using Zoom as the chat tool for questions. So please feel free to pop your questions into the chat on um, obviously topics of treaty, nation building, and the ATNS. And um, from there, I will attempt to put your questions to the panel. Uh, there'll be many questions and there are many panelists, but I'll do my best to connect question and panelist. As I mentioned earlier, we are particularly lucky not tonight to have an expert panel. And I now wish to turn to introduce them to you. And let me start with an introduction of Professor Marcia Langton, who of course will be known to many of you here. Professor Dr. Marcia Langton AO is a descendant of the Iman people of Queensland. She's an anthropologist, and geographer. And since 2000 has held the foundation chair of Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne, where she is also the Associate Provost. Marcia has published in the fields of political and legal anthropology, Indigenous agreements and engagement with the minerals industry and Indigenous culture and art. Marcia has contributed to policy development and been a public intellectual and advocate for Aboriginal rights for a long period. Uh, it's also a pleasure to introduce Mr. Jamie Lowe. Jamie is a Gujijmara Jabarong man and CEO of the National Native Title Council, NNTC. Jamie is an elected representative on the historic First People's Assembly of Victoria, representing the Eastern Ma people, tasked with negotiating a treaty framework with the Victorian government. Jamie was previously CEO of the Eastern Ma Aboriginal Corporation, appointed by the Federal Court to hold native title rights and interests for the Eastern Ma citizens over their country in southwestern Victoria. Jamie stays involved in community and the negotiation of settlement for future Eastern Ma claims and is a strong advocate for traditional owners both in Victoria and across Australia. Indeed, I think he, enjoy, he joins us tonight having recently been involved in just that work. Our third panelist is my dear colleague, Dr. Amanda Porter, who is a descendant of the Bringer clan of the Yuan nation on the south coast of New South Wales. Amanda was appointed as Senior Fellow Indigenous Programs at the Melbourne Law School in 2020. Uh, Amanda joins us tonight from Sydney. Amanda's work examines the violence of police security with a particular focus on deaths in custody, premature deaths and near misses. She's working with Eddie Cabillo and Kirsty Gover on the establishment of the Indigenous Law and Justice Hub at MLS, which will provide a vehicle for the school to work with community. We will begin our discussion by showing a short video about the ATNS website. Welcome to ATNS. ATNS is an information gateway to more than two and a half thousand agreements between Indigenous people and others in Australia and overseas. We also have resources on nation building, agreement making and treaties. Our goal is to empower traditional owners through access to information. Using this search tool, you can find agreements, related case law, legislation and more. Each search result links you to relevant information such as parties to agreements, organisations, glossary terms and references, including academic articles and press releases. Clicking on a glossary term takes you to its definition. 
Browse the glossary using the alphabetical links at the top of the page. ATNS also provides general information on topics like native title, land and water rights, and more. Use the interactive map to find Indigenous land use agreements and other information by location. Click on an area. The link will take you to available information. From the home page, access our advanced search. This allows searching by category, location, date range, and more. We hope you enjoy exploring the materials on ATNS and learning more about our agreements with Indigenous peoples. Contact us if you know of other agreements to add to our records. And it is a truly wonderful website. And I think we ought now consider it launched and turn to the panelists. Jamie, I wondered if I could start with you. What do you see as the future of ATNS and how can the resource um, help support traditional owners in their agreement making? Um, thanks, Pip, and thanks for the introduction earlier. And I would also like to pay my respects to um, the custodians of country um, we've looked after country here for um, um, coming up now to 100,000 years, um, an incredible amount of time. And I'd like to pay my respects to Uncle Dave and acknowledge his welcome um, earlier, pay my respects to my elders, both past and present, um, pay my respect to, um, to Professor Marcy Langdon um, and other um, Indigenous people on the, on the meeting today. Um, I think the... Um, the future of the ATNS, you know, and now working in, in the space, but you know, obviously being heavily involved in um, Indigenous rights and since since a kid, um, my elders was, would always tell me knowledge is power, um, and it's a key element of self determination. So I think um, the launch of the of the new website is critical to that, um, and being able to access that information um, individually and as a collective um, communities. Um, on what's gone before you. Um, I think that here in Australia, we're entering into an unprecedented time of um, agreement making. Um, we've got the treaty process in Victoria, Northern Territory is also embarking on that process, Queensland. We have other substantial agreements across the country through native title. Um, we've got the Yamaji people who've just negotiated a fantastic outcome over with the WA government. The people of the Noongar are um, still negotiating with the WA government. Um, the Yaru people um, some years ago negotiating deals, Victorian Traditional Owner Settlement Act, Land Rights Act, New South Wales, um, NT. Um, but I think now is, is time we're pivoting to um, a rights-based conversation. I know that we've act activated those rights and um, you know marched the streets for those rights for some time. So we've still got a way to go. Um, but I think the, um, the, the knowledge that the ACNS website holds will help our community and individuals um, enact those rights. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Thanks very much. And maybe let's turn from the resource. Marcia, if I can ask you briefly to reflect on um, the most significant developments or hurdles uh, in researching and working on agreements between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples? Uh, thanks, Pip, and uh, thanks to Uncle Dave for the wonderful welcome. I acknowledge the traditional owners of Naram, Wurundjeri and Glenarong peoples, and all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us today. I acknowledge all the elders. Uh, very good question, Pip. I'm glad that you acknowledge the people from the law school who helped to build this uh, ATNS uh, project across three ARC linkage projects. So the, in effect, the, uh, when the law school was involved, uh, you know, uh, with uh, your 
wonderful people as chief investigators, the project ran for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So they dedicated, some of them dedicated 10 years of their lives to this. And, uh, you know, I'm glad you acknowledged Maureen and Lee and Miranda, um, Emily Odette, Alistair Webster, uh, and many others. Uh, so in the first place, we had no idea what was going to happen. So we started all of this uh, at around the time when, you know, the, the potential of the right to negotiate in the Native Title Act was starting to become evident. And there had been a few agreements. And what we were aiming for was a number of things. Well, let's track the agreement making under the Native Title Act, the right to negotiate, but also what else is going on um, in Aboriginal rights, well, you know, the context of agreement making. Uh, we aimed for transparency in agreement making, uh, which we didn't ever entirely achieve uh, because most of the agreements have commercial and confidence uh, provisions. And so uh, designing the projects, well, you know, in that, and you've mentioned that it's an interdisciplinary project, very much so. So having the people from the law school, like Maureen and Lee and later Miranda, but, um, and uh, Glenn McLaren from Environmental Solutions, mm -hmm. designing the interactive database from the beginning, setting up the fields, uh, doing the research right from the very beginning to try to understand what would agreements encompass. So you can see now uh, when you use the database that we have, you know, more than 50 fields that you can search their categories, their fields, um, and, you, and you can use those to search for agreements. Um, and, and the content of the database built slowly and as it built up as a result of the wonderful work of the law students and the interns from the Aurora project over the years, we, we started to realize that there were some pretty serious problems. And so then we had to develop further research questions. So the ARC projects are, are described. So first of all, you know, it was the this, the idea of documenting agreement making and treaties and negotiated settlements. And then we moved on to implementation. And then we moved on to, well, you know, what are the consequences of implementation? Well, you run into the problem of had, having to set up prescribed bodies, corporate trusts, uh, the taxation. And we uh, became very much involved in the policy making and legislative change. So, I mean, it's, it's so complicated, Pip. It's a great story to tell. One day we'll write the history of it. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, we chased a rapidly developing field from um, about, you know, 2002 to now. So nearly 20 years of chasing agreements and trying to keep up. And then uh, more recently, so, so, you know, we didn't get an ARC grant again at a certain point. Um, and, and then the, under Jamie's leadership, uh, we were asked to uh, update the, the website uh, to make it relevant to the new process of treaty making here in Victoria and, as you know, developing elsewhere in Australia, in Queensland and the Northern Territory. And, you know, as soon as we were invited to do that, we jumped at the chance. So it's been wonderful to yeah. work with the National Native Title Council in the first phase and now in this phase. So, uh, you know, I think we have a, an extraordinary uh, resource to hand over uh, to our whole community of people, the National Native Title Council, traditional owners, the university, researchers, and I do hope that, you know, students in the, in the law school will remain involved and we'll have to work out a way to make sure that they do. Um, mm -hmm. But also to, you know, invite the community to become more involved. Uh, as, as mentioned by Talia, who did the voiceover in the, 
explanatory video. We'd love to have more feedback from communities on, on agreements that we might have missed. Mm -hmm. So I, I truly want to make uh, the whole project much more interactive. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope that answers some of your question. Yeah, no, it's great. And it's a, it's, it's a dynamic website, right? So it's a call out for us all to contribute to it across time. So thank you very much, Marcia. Amanda, I know you've got some connectivity issues, so your camera might not be on, but I'm pretty confident you can hear me. I understand that you've worked directly with the ATNS resource. And I think it might be uh, great for people with us this evening if you'd share a bit of your experience about how the ATNS resource has been helpful to you. Thanks, Pip. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, fine. Fantastic. I'm sorry, I just don't, sorry to be rude by not putting my camera on. I've just, um, it, my Zoom is struggling here. But um, just before I answer your question, Pip, um, I'm on Gadigal Wongal country here in Sydney. Um, I want to thank Uncle Dave for the um, warm welcome and his wise words, which I think go to the heart to this topic this afternoon and the launch of the website. And I want to acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on the Zoom and wish you all a happy NAIDOC week. And I'd also like to extend my sincere thanks to Professor Marcia Langton for inviting me to speak. So um, to go back to your question about um, uh, how I've how the ATNS website has been useful for me, um, I first came across the agreements, treaties and negotiated settlements website about 15 years ago when I was researching night patrols, uh, first mm -hmm. as an honours student and later as a PhD candidate. And the website was useful because it provided an extensive national database on agreement making and governance between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations and the state. And I think it's fair to say that it was and it remains um, the only resource of its kind that captures this information um, and which records agreements as a as primary source material. And in fact, I struggle to think of a similar resource which exists internationally, but um, maybe just by way of example. So my PhD research was an empirical study on the everyday operation of night patrols in the state of New South Wales. So I had three case studies, Burke and Dubbo, which had a night patrol since the mid 1990s and Redfern, which had a street beat, which operated in various forms since the 1970s when members of the Black Panther Party in Oakland, California met with prominent activists in Redfern to set up, to set up a, a pig patrol. So night patrols are community safety and defence initiatives which are set up to, well, first of all, to improve safety in local Aboriginal communities and, and equally importantly, which operate independently of the state police. Um, and at the time of my study, um, the key work ha had been done by Professor Marcia Langton in the late 1980s, who'd written about night patrols in the NT um, and several submissions and, and reports. But apart from that, um, there was not there was limited research. So as I said, my PhD was empirical, empirical, so observing night patrol operations, interviewing patrol workers and how they saw their role. Um, it included an archival and oral histories component. And I was able to use the ATNS website, I guess, as a way of triangulating oral histories, as well as documenting the exact terms and nature of each of these agreements between the local patrols and state entities at a particular point in time. So for example, memora, memora of, um, memoranda of understanding with the local police and the local area commands, uh, written agreements um, with uh, state government entities and, and also with IATSIS and regional governance structures such as Muddy Parky and so on. So I guess as, as you can appreciate from all of this, the, the point I'm getting at is that the governance structures and agreements and regulatory frameworks between local night patrols and various state government entities is very complex. And the ATNS website provided an, an authoritative record of each of these agreements at a point in time. Um, so in that way, it enabled me to capture this complexity um, with, great, with greater accuracy than I otherwise would have been able to if, say, I was just relying on state archives or state records. And for this, um, for these and many other reasons, for, for this and other research projects, it's been an, an invaluable research and referencing tool. Well, fantastic, Amanda. And let us hope that many scholars following you will find the resource uh, as useful. 
We're starting to take some of the questions from participants this evening. So um, Marcia, if I can turn to you in the first instance, I've got a question here from uh, Robin Margot, who asks about the differences in support for the diverse treaty processes we have underway in Australia, like the one uh, in Victoria, and also the, the mention of treaty also in the Uluru Statement of the Heart. So um, really a question to you around the differences in support for treaty making uh, federally and across the different states and territories. Yeah, uh, an interesting question. And one I think that uh, we're, we will all follow up at the treaty conference next year. Um, so I hope that somebody from ANTAR can, uh, you know, provide uh, all the attendees with information about that very important conference coming up, um, and the Melbourne Law School is a sponsor. Um, so, uh, look, there's been a treaty movement in Australia for, you know, for decades. Uh, I've, I wrote about it about 20 years ago in my Alfred Deacon lecture, which is published in um, Postcolonial Studies, called Dominion in an article called Dominion and Dishonor. Um, the minister mentioned the ATSIC section, section 13 Committee on Treaties. Uh, that was, uh, you know, 20 years ago as well. Um, there was there was a, a treaty um, movement amongst white people led by the late Nugget Coombs and um, some other very famous Australians. But then uh, in, Victor in Victoria, the traditional owners were the first Aboriginal people to break through the wall of resistance at the governmental level and, and Victoria has made the most progress. And I'll leave it to, to Jamie to explain that great progress. So they, you know, they have their own treaty assembly that's been elected now. So once Victoria, you know, broke the damn walls, as it were, um, nor the Northern Territory and then Queensland followed suit. And they've conducted inquiries and uh, in the Northern Territory, Mick Dodson was appointed a treaty commissioner and there are other treaty commissioners who have been appointed, I understand, and similarly in Queensland, people have been appointed to Aboriginal people and have been app appointed to oversee the process. And this is why the Uluru Statement from the Heart has that um, triumvirate of issues. Um, and, you know, and Makarata is the term that they've borrowed from the Yolngu language to address this development of treaties. So makarata is a, a Yolngu term um, for a, a ritual, um, not, much, not often seen these days, uh, but still extremely meaningful um, in life in Arnhem Land. And there are other versions of it across the country with different names. And it's a dispute resolution ritual. I won't go into the details, that's for another time. Um, but how do we then uh, make sure that treaties that are developed maintain a, a standard that, for instance, uh, complies with human rights, especially Indigenous rights as set out in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People? Um, you know, one of the first attempts at a treaty in Australia was right here um, in Victoria, the, the so-called Batman Treaty. It was never formalised because, uh, well, it was dodgy from all sorts of angles, but of course, the Home Office would not allow a treaty in Australia. And unlike other British settler colonies, the United States colonies and, and colonies in Canada, they they would not negotiate treaties with Aboriginal people. And so the Batman Treaty was ruled out by the Home Office. But, uh, and, and there have been various extinguishing acts in Australia as well. So we have a problem. We have this complicated history 
of the absence of treaties in Australia, suddenly we have the opportunity to negotiate modern treaties. And I think we can do a lot better than the modern treaties in Canada. And it's, it's likely that we already have one. So I refer you to the article uh, by, um, I think it's um, Harry Blagg and uh, George Williams on the, the Noongar settlement. Mm -hmm. And they uh, write about it as a modern treaty. Mm -hmm. Well, my thinking is if that's the case, so too is the Western Cape York coexistence agreement with Camalco, because likewise it's a comprehensive settlement and uh, the Queensland government as the Crown is a party. So we need, oh, sorry, Harry Hobbs, thank you, Mariba. Mm -hmm. um, um, Harry Hobbs and George Williams. And, it's, and we've got the, the article on our website. Uh, so what do we do? How do we make sure that uh, treaties maintain, you know, standards of human rights and Indigenous rights and also don't take away existing legal rights of Indigenous people. You know, we've accumulated such a number of important legal rights through agreement making, we can't now let these rights, you know, slip through the cracks in yet another process. So I was thinking, and there's no meat on the bones on the Makarata idea coming out of the Uluru Statement from the heart, but it would be a very good idea to have a Makarata Commission or a National Treaty Commission to ensure that treaties don't um, derogate uh, from our rights that we've spent so many decades achieving. Mm -hmm. So that's the best answer I can give in a yes. short period of time, but I hope we get to discuss it at next year's conference. Indeed, Marcia, indeed. Jamie, if I can turn to you, um, I want to weave a couple of questions together. In effect, I want to take up Marcia's invitation to you to speak to the treaty and tr the progress on treaty in Victoria. Um, and so call on uh, you to address us on that. But in so doing, we've also got a question from Sabine, who asks more particularly if treaties can include protection of sacred Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sites. So a general comment on the progress of treaty in Victoria and then the more particular question of protection of sacred sites, if I can, Jamie. Yeah, um, thanks Pip and thanks for the lead in Marcia. And um, like, so like Marcia said, this isn't a new conversation. It's, um, it's an incredibly old one. Um, I think the last um, uh, Commonwealth Government, which really had a focus in committing um, to a treaty process, was the Keating Government back in the early 90s, um, the famous Redfern Statement, where, where Keating talked about treaty making with the um, Indigenous peoples of Australia, which was critical. Um, they lost government um, in, the, in the 90s and Howard got in, and I guess the rest is history, isn't it? Um, and and so what we see, we also seen um, a, a couple of years ago where the, the South Australian um, Aboriginal peoples were embarking on a treaty process with, with the Labor government there. They lost power um, and the treaty conversation has somewhat gone away. I'm sure it hasn't gone away for the um, Indigenous people of um, South Australia, but it has the will, will of the government has gone. So I think what was critical in the Victorian process um, is that We've always been pretty well known as um, a staunch mob down here, um, um, leading activist um, marches in the streets and, and, and chanting for our rights, and that hasn't gone away. And, you know, we see powerful images from back in the 60s and 70s, and that continued. And I think um, we finally, as Marcia put it, broke the, the damn wall through, um, through leadership of our elders, et cetera, and that, um, I think it was about 2016 when at a community meeting where we kind of actually broke through there, it might have been a little bit earlier than that. So even this current process has been the best part of five years. Um, and us as an assembly, um, we voted in last year. It was an incredibly, incredibly rigorous process and, um, and the rigour hasn't gone, gone away um, as it sits. So, um, there's um, over 30 members on the assembly um, represented across the whole state of Victoria um, from reserved seats with um, existing rights from those 
um, that were um, voted in through general election, through the treaty election. So there's over 30 of us. We've got a great diverse group of, um, of um, both male and female, young and old, um, and the middle age. I fit in the middle age these days. I'm not quite old, I'm not quite young. <laughs> um, but for my people um, and for the people across the state, it's an incredibly exciting time. Um, our conversations on a daily basis about the, the generation in front of us and the generations to come and creating legacy for those young people. I think our Uncle Dave put it really well earlier, earlier today. Um, Speaking about how we've got to lead the country in, a, in, a, um, in, a, in the state is what we found it, um, if not a better state, and I think treaty can do that. Um, and to the kind of um, question around kind of laws and legislation, particularly around heritage and, and scarred sites, I think treaty can absolutely do that. Um, I think we're, we're dreaming pretty big um, down here in the state. Um, we've got hindsight from across the globe of what has worked, what hasn't worked and what's been able to negotiate um, through treaty. Um, and I think that the more, I guess, political power you have, and it's something that I'm, I'm sure will be a part of our treaty negotiations and having that, whether it be reserved seats in parliament or having our own parliament. So you actually have, not going to, we know how it works, you know, um, we know that legislation, um, whether it be through heritage legislation, laws, education, whatever, whatever it may be, our mob, generally goes cap in hand to the government and say, these laws aren't working for us, they need to change. That's happening at the moment across the country through um, heritage legislation. WA is a big thing at the moment. We've had Duke and Gorge earlier this year. Mm -hmm. We're putting pressure on the federal government to, um, to enhance their heritage protection laws. Um, if treaty was there and we had our own government, would actually have the say in actually writing legislation rather than going cap in hand and asking them to change that. So. Within, when we embark on that and when we get established um, processes in place um, with um, here in Victoria, I'm sure that we can further enhance heritage protection throughout the state of Victoria and then therefore throughout the country as well. So Jamie, just sticking with you for a minute, um, the, the, there is a further question on the treaty process from Muriel Bamblett, who's asking um, in the Victorian context, how do you make treaty binding? Um, thanks for the um, question, Aunty Muriel. I think the most critical part of a binding treaty is getting the, um, the authority from your people. Um, I know through my negotiations, through other processes and seeing that within my role across the country, that the threshold that you reach um, to get consensus with your people is incredibly important. And, that, and so you need to have the binding cultural authority from your people first. Um, of course, the, um, the other critical element is getting the, um, the state to agree to terms um, within those contractual, contractual arrangements um, with the state of Victoria, and they'll have their politics that they need to see sort out behind the scenes as well. But I think the, the most critical threshold is getting buy-in from the people um, in, in the negotiation process and um, binding those legal, legal um, contracts with, with the state of Victoria. Good on you. Thanks very much, Jamie. Amanda, can I just check you're with us? Yeah, I'm here, Pip, but unfortunately I'm experiencing some connectivity issues and I missed a, a great deal of what Jamie and Marcia said. Um, it's okay. I've got a special question for you, a self-contained question. Um, in thinking about um, the good faith needed for treaty making, Amanda, mm -hmm. and knowing that you've worked extensively in the areas of police accountability and oversight, both uh, in relation to historical and contemporary violence, what do you think is needed to establish trust in state institutions for a treaty making process or a treaty negotiation? Oh, thanks, Pip. That's um, uh, the question of um, good faith is in relation to policing is so complex and um, there's a lot to that question. But I think um, the short and my unsatisfactory answer is that, of course, there needs to be structural change um, in terms of fundamental rethink of, in the relationship between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations and the state and federal police, but also in terms of structural change of... Um, Indigenous peoples and communities having a say in the policing that occurs on country um, and in terms of, of course, accountability for deaths in custody and fatal, fatal shootings and police brutality. But to take 
take all of that back a step. Um, all of this, of course, begins with the need, I think, for Australians to come to terms with the true history of policing in this country. And I don't think we've got there yet. Um, Australian policing was forged in racist and colonial violence. And this included police involvement in massacres in the 18th and the 19th century, but it police involvement in massacres continued even into the 20th century with, uh, you know, Bedford Downs and Coniston in the 20s and Skull Creek in 1975, um, among so many others. So, um, uh, and I, I think law schools have a responsibility in educating um, about this history, um, but it should also be part of the compulsory syllabus in Australian schools and police academies and in these public conversations um, and the history of this is just one component this but it's borne out in you know today in police in deaths in police custody in um, in police brutality in systemic neglect in terms of um, how do you say um, uh, substandard police investigations into missing and murdered Indigenous women and children, as we saw in Bowerville and, and across the nation. And, um, uh, you know, it's, there's been over 439 deaths since the Royal Commission, and um, that which, which itself looked at 99 deaths. And one of the most frustrating things researching and advocating in this space is the sheer quantity of paper and findings from these Royal Commissions and inquiries and inquests, which um, from the 70s until now. And, and, and um, I guess while that's frustrating for me as a researcher, I, I struggle to think about bereaved families and how they deal with the grief of losing a loved one compounded with the systemic racism that they face before the coronial and criminal jurisdiction. And then, um, uh, and I think in particular about the Day family who lost their mother and grandmother in virtually the same circumstances that they lost another member of their extended family 30 years ago. Um, so um, for me, I think policing is, like that question is just, um, uh, one that I think about a lot, but it, I think it's really the thorny issue for legal pluralism and treaties and agreement making. But I think um, there's, you know, the question of how do you restore trust? But I think more than this, we need to think about can we restore trust at all? And I just want to say that it's to an extent that it's that that's a limitation on my ability to even speak to this because I think different families and different communities um, will have different responses to this. Yeah. Yeah. I Thank you, Amanda. Looking at this issue, Marcia, if we can, um, in a slightly different way, there's a, a further question from Sabine asking how treaties can actually help prevent um, human rights violations, for example, uh, such as those um, in the Northern Territory intervention. So put another way, how might treaty or the existence of treaty have changed, avoided or shaped that policy? Oh, I, I don't think it would have made a bit of difference because um, the Howard government quite deliberately suspended the Racial Discrimination Act uh, in order to, uh, to legislate the Northern Territory Emergency Intervention. But just to make a point there, it's, it's not the case that that, uh, it's not true that that continues to be the case because a subsequent Labor government reinstated the Racial Discrimination Act. Um, so, uh, and you know, some of these matters have been to court and uh, the, you know, the real problem is Australia's commitment to human rights. It becomes, it, is, it has been worn down progressively over the years. So whereas um, in other parts of the world where uh, members of the member states of the United Nations have committed to um, conventions on human rights, they have developed uh, the, you know, the infrastructure for the implementation of rights um, in their jurisdictions and regions. So, you know, you have, for instance, in the Americas, uh, a, a regional commission on human rights. We don't have any such thing in Australia and the Pacific. 
our human rights commission is, you know, is uh, is pilloried by by governments repeatedly. Um, uh, the the commissioners are treated with contempt. You'll remember what happened to Julie, Gillian Treeks. Um, so, you know, you can have all of the abstract rights that you like, and Australia is a signatory to many conventions, but it's the lack of respect for human rights and the complete lack of understanding of what human rights means, um, what, you know, and, and, and how they benefit everybody. That's the real problem. So uh, in the Northern Territory many years ago, I'm trying to remember when, well, it was back in the 90s, there was a, uh, there were two constitutional conventions, uh, one in Central Australia and one in the top end, uh, to change the Northern Territory constitution uh, and, and to put uh, Aboriginal rights into a Northern Territory constitution. Um, and it, it didn't result in anything. Um, people, you know, the Northern Territory governments have, you know, all of them have ignored uh, those demands. And so too, the federal government ignored the, all of the petitions from the Northern Territory, um, including the, um, the original petition in Yongamatha from Yurikawa, the bark petitions, right through to the Barunga Statement, which was presented to Bob Hawke and um, his Minister for um, Aboriginal Affairs at the time. Um, and, and, and there have been, by my count, five or six inquiries into constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians, and still they, you know, kick the bucket down the road or kick the can down the road so uh, the problem is the, the lack of political will. And I, I've, I've been wondering why it is that there's this total resistance from all parties to formal relationships with Indigenous Australians, to giving us a place in the nation that's honourable and, and, you know, understanding that if they did so, they'd overcome their own lack of legitimacy here. And it, it goes to that question of legitimacy. They don't want their, their legitimacy as a settler state questioned. Mm -hmm. And also there's a, a racist stereotype that, you know, should they recognise such rights, they might be up for, for reparations, financial reparations. And you'll remember that that uh, was John Howard's mm -hmm. Uh, secondary objection to apologising to the stolen generations. In the first place, he disagreed that they were stolen against all the historical evidence. Um, and, and secondly, he refused absolutely to apologise on the grounds that it might involve financial reparations. And basically, there have never been adequate financial reparations for the terrible suffering inflicted on all of those victims. So I don't think there's an easy answer to your question. We just have to keep um, uh, pursuing our rights. And, 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 and we have built up a body of rights from almost nothing when I, you know, came of age, when I didn't even have the right to vote um, and I wasn't counted in the census, uh, to now, you know, there, there is a body of rights and, it's, and, you know, we all stand on the, on the shoulders of giants and we must be you know, very thankful to them for decades of hard work and getting us to where we are now, but there's more work to do. Yeah. So to cut a long story short, there's no straightforward answer. Yeah. Um, but and I don't think treaties by themselves are going to solve the problem. I think we need, you know, to, to build a spider web of, of rights, duties, obligations. You know, I think the duties of governments <coughs> are not sufficiently discussed. Mm. And, and, you know, it's almost at the stage where politicians think that they can <clears throat> do whatever they like, uh, that they don't have any obligations to the people that they represent and especially not to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So mm. uh, there's a great deal of maturation of the debate and the concepts 
um, required, but I think, you know, Victoria is definitely leading the way. Uh, but let's, you know, just keep working on it. I think we will make progress in the next 10 years. Great. Thanks. I, hope to, I hope we achieve something before I die. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, Marcia, I'm sure. Jamie, can I come back to you? It's in fact with a, a technical question that, that picks, goes back to this question of, of power to make treaty. And I have a question from Solomon Obulor, which is can Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may not be able to prove continuity of observance of customary law and connection to land, uh, quite possibly due to colonisation, still be able to negotiate treaty outside the native title regime? So a question of, of standing and negotiation for you, Jamie. Yeah, well, I guess um, it's, it's a good question and the threshold of native title is, um, you know, somewhat troublesome for, for our people, particularly through um, the colonisation of kind of, of the, particularly the urban areas. A lot of yeah. us are on Rwandry country, Melbourne. Um, a lot of the Rwandry mob have moved off to the mission station up there. I think Uncle Dave talked about it. He was at Corrindirk there, Hillsville, um, where a lot of the mob got moved to. Um, but I think, um, so the question of standing, um, so Victoria through, um, I think it was a result of the Yorta Yorta um, decision, um, um, the negative decision of native title. Um, and I think that the justice um, at the time, the, the quote was um, the tides of history has, has washed away your native title right. And so the Victorian people responded to that. Um, the, um, the, we spoke before about, you know, the staunchness of, of our people and, um, I think what was produced out of that was a Victorian Traditional Owner Settlement Act. Um, and there's a whole lot of different things in there, but um, one, of, one of those is that you don't need to establish continued continuity of connection to country. You need to prove that you are the right people for country, um, but that, that threshold that the Native Title Act, um, you know, provision there, um, it's, it, it, it's a bit more flexible in that regard. So. I'd imagine here in Victoria, uh, and I would encourage kind of when, you know, when and if um, the rest of the country embarks on, on the treaty process as they recognise the, um, the impact of colonisation um, and invasion on, um, on our Indigenous communities. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, Jamie. Now, um, we're running low on time, so I want to really turn to a final question that each of you might respond to very briefly. And that is with treaty process, so we'll start with you, Jamie, with treaty process in Victoria, the Northern Territory, and also Queensland, what is the next significant development that will take treaty further in Australia? Well, geez, that's a big question. <laughs> Take and your pick. Ten huh? seconds. <laughs> ten seconds. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess from a technical perspective, we've got to get we've got to put pen to paper. Yeah. Um, and we've got to start drafting the treaty and what that looks like in the framework. So that's a big threshold for our people down here. So yeah. um, I know it's kind of a bit of a boring question of drafting it, but that's where we need to get to. But it's a critical question, isn't yeah. it, Jamie? So from Jamie, we've got drafting. Marcia, what what would you offer to that question? Uh, yeah, well, you know, as Jamie says, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. As Jamie says, uh, uh, you know, the Victorian um, Treaty Assembly and its, it, its, const its constituents need to put pen to paper and, uh, and do it quickly be before there's a change of government uh, that might, you know, not agree with a treaty. Um, we've had this wonderful window of opportunity. I'd hate to see that window of opportunity shut before there's real progress on this. But I think, you know, we, we will uh, make advances if we can encourage people to become more informed about these issues. So there was a good question before about why some Aboriginal people um, object to the Uluru Statement from the heart and prefer treaties over the Uluru Statement from the heart. Well, you know, that, that's because they haven't read the ATNS website. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and say, have a look at Canada. Canada has a very interesting constitution. And the, there were amendments made to the Canadian constitution after 
the repatriation of the Canadian Constitution back in 1982. And it put the, the First Nations people in Canada objected to the repatriation of the Constitution that did not include them and their treaty rights. And as a result, they got Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution that entrenches their treaty rights, basically. It's more complicated than that. And they also obtained the constitutional right uh, called the duty to consult. So there's the, the Canadian Crown has the duty to consult with First Nations people. So in Canada, those constitutional rights absolutely protect those treaties. The, the First Nations, well, it was actually the First Nations Assembly chiefs who went to the Queen during the repatriation process and said, our treaties are with you, you know, and they cited um, George the, the Third and, and others with whom treaties had been settled and negotiated. And uh, they said to the Queen, you know, we don't want a, a new constitution in Canada that removes our treaty rights. We want our treaty rights recognised. And so Canada did the right thing. And, and in, but in Australia, these matters cannot even be discussed uh, at all. There's no mature debate about these issues because conservatives run straight to, you know, uh, the, the sky is going to fall in arguments. So, you know, when the Uluru Statement from the Heart raised a, a national voice, uh, the proposition was made by Barnaby Joyce, which was then picked up by Malcolm Turnbull, that that would mean an end to parliamentary sovereignty and a third chamber, which is absolute nonsense. And, and these uh, processes work very well in other um, countries. You have the Sami parliament um, in Norway, you have uh, uh, treaties in Canada, you have treaties in the United States of America, you have constitutional indigenous rights in Canada, you have domestic dependent sovereignty in the United States, but here in Australia, forever, the Conservatives are going to hold that we're ignorant savages that you can't do treaties with. I mean, so I, I guess you have one last year here is the critical nature of learning from our, our friends and, and um, those who've had more success with treaty and recognition across the globe. Yeah? Yes. That's yeah. right. Uh, Amanda, can I pull you in here at this point? Would you like to um, offer your view on, on what we need? Um, I apologise, Pip. I, I, I missed your question because um, of my internet connection and I'm afraid I also missed miss, miss part of Jamie's answer. So, um, But if you wouldn't mind repeating and I can try to answer. Absolutely. What, what, what we've really thrown across to the panel is given the treaty process underway now in Victoria, Northern Territory and Queensland, what is the next development that will further treaty in this country? And very crudely paraphrasing our extraordinary experts, Jamie's really talking about yeah. the need to... I, I can understand why, he, why there was a, that was met with laughter in terms of a very brief answer, like it's yeah, hard to know right. where to begin. And, and you yeah, dropped okay. out at that point. <laughs> Jamie talked of drafting and Marcia talked about the lessons around the globe for Australia in terms of treaty making. So your final yeah. comment? My apologies. And I, I um, f feel that um, my, um, I, I, you know, it's better to, to leave it on Jamie and Marcia's um, opinion. They have much more to say on it. The only thing I thought I, I could add, I guess, is that, um, uh, you know, there's a need to, um, this is also an opportunity in terms of, you know, this particular point in time in Australia, with Australia being a legally pluralistic nation where Aboriginal sovereignty um, came first and was never ceded. And in terms of non-Indigenous claims of sovereignty, well, the High Court of Australia has declared that, you know, the means by which Australia, non-Indigenous Australia claims its sovereignty is a legal fiction. So I think it's important to um, reflect on all of this and um, the authority and legitimacy of non-Indigenous claims to governance and what um, Indigenous nation rebuilding can add to to this and to, to improvement of uh, 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 public governance uh, for all Australians. And I think... Um, 
um, you know, it, it's um, and there, as as Marcy said, in terms of the you know examples, there's there's such good you know it's good timing at the moment in terms of uh, yeah. I'll I'll just leave it. I'll just um we'll we'll leave it there. And um, I just wanted to say that um, yeah, in, in not with. I think we've just lost Amanda again. Um, but a call for us, I think, to recognise the moment, the, the long moment historically and the current moment that is now. Sorry. Marcia, can I um, turn to you in conclusion? Um, the ATNS website is one of your very many projects and I wondered if you just wanted to make a comment in closing about the website. I, I do, and along with the wonderful people at your law school, Pip, uh, Professor Nicholson, who, who, you know, were the founders and uh, of this project and worked so hard on it, for, as I said, for 10 years. I also want to thank the current team, particularly Marie Burroughs, Emily Cheeseman and Sh Sharon Amer, but also the wonderful interns who've joined us from the Aurora Project, Ingrid Bennett, Alice Spencer, Zoe Andritsos, Lene Mitulineos, excuse me if I don't pronounce these names correctly, Coco Watanabe, Ella Bilton Goff, Alicia Bala, Laura Rose, Sophie Clappen, Grusha Malik, Janelle Shaptini, Madeline Bentley, and Melissa, Melissa Rutherford. Uh, a big thank you to Glenn McLaren and Mark Shalu from Environmental System Solutions for their help over many years in developing the database and the website. Also thanks to Audrey Armer for her early input into the website redesign and helping us foreground the user experience. Alice Allen for her copy editing expertise. Gabriel Murphy and Jenny Austin from the University of Melbourne communications team. Kristen Smith and the Indigenous Studies Unit. Jamie Lowe and Megan Giles from the National Native Title Council for their enormous support for the website redesign and with this event, Paul Wright and Michael Anderson from ANTAR for their hard work on this event uh, and the National Native Title Tribunal. And also a big thank you to you and Amanda and our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Duncan Maskell and Minister Ken Wyatt for their very kind words tonight. Um, I hope I haven't forgotten anybody, uh, mm. but you know, as always, it's a big team effort. Yeah, thanks very much, Marcia. Um, for those of you who submitted a question that I didn't get to, sincere apologies. Um, just in closing, I think I'd love to give a plug for the next and final treaty webinar series for this year. And that's taking place on the 9th of December. And it's a particular focus on treaty in the States. Um, so on the 9th, you can hear from Dr. Jackie Huggins and Mick Gooder from Queensland, uh, from Professor Mick Dodson and Ursula Raymond from the Northern Territory Treaty Commission, and Reuben Berg and Jamie Lowe again from the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria. Um, we look forward to seeing you then. Once again, can I thank the panellists? Um, you're a wonderful group of people, and it's been an absolutely privilege to sit with you and hear your thoughts tonight. So uh, Jamie Lowe, Dr. Amanda Porter and Professor Marcia Langton, sincere thanks for joining us on the panel tonight. And also thanks to the University of Melbourne, the National Native Title Council, ANTA, and of course, ATNS. And we hope to see you visiting the website shortly. Good night and um, take care. Thank you all. Thanks very much, Pip.